We've been conditioned to think that bacteria, the little organisms we can't see, are kind of gross, and we've also been led, led to believe that they can always make us sick. In fact, microbiologists are now learning that some bacteria can actually make us healthier. There's some incredible research happening in this area, and we spoke to one of Canada's leading microbiologists, Brett Finley of UBC, about this, and we joined him at the Personal Performance Summit in Toronto, which was sponsored by TD Wealth. It feels as though as we are undergoing a bacteria renaissance, and you know, what was bad is good now. Tell me just uh, you know, a bit about um, you know, why you wrote your book. Is it really to educate the masses on, on what's going, what, why we need our bacteria? Yeah, so I mean, we have to think historically a bit. 125 years ago, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur showed that microbes cause disease. And that was a big leap forward. We realized, you know, this is what causes tuberculosis and syphilis and all these other horrible diseases, smallpox. So then Pasteur also showed if you killed microbes through pasteurization, you didn't get disease. So society went on this major campaign of hygiene for the last 125 years. They brought in antibodies, clean up the food, bring in sanitation, kill all microbes. And we've done a really good job in that. And we look at pretty much any infectious disease that goes like this. Then you look at the other stuff. Well, what do we see in this world? We see obesity, asthma, diabetes, allergies, autism, IBD. Every one of those diseases is going like this. How come? And so this is where the microbes come into play. And what we now realize in our quest to get rid of all these bad microbes, we also killed a lot of the good ones that we normally evolve with. And now in the last 10 years or so, we realize that those microbes that we live with, they're part of us. They, they, they make us function normally. They help the brain develop, the gut develop, the immune system develop. And we're getting rid of those things. And so every generation gets cleaner and cleaner, and we don't have the microbes our great-great-grandparents had, for example. Where are we in this, in this um, uh you know, bringing this out to the masses, I'll say, because I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been hearing about the biome now for a few years now, right. and I mean, it's pretty. When you say those things, I'm, you know, it's startling to hear that all these diseases are caused by lack. Uh, it sounds as though bacteria oh, related, or microbes yeah, are yeah, related yeah, to, yeah, yeah. but that's not something that seems to be something that's, you know, to the masses yet. Like when I go to my doctor, or someone goes, to their doctor still, you know, diabetes is still a nutritional thing. It's not a microbial thing. Right. So it's when, coming, is it? and, and ironically, I think it's more in the public than it is in the medical world because the clinical trials are not quite there yet. Um, I mean, most people have heard of fecal transfers, and there's this disease caused by Clostridium difficile. It's a very nasty disease. You get it by taking antibiotics, and so antibiotics don't treat it. Um, so if you have a fecal transfer, you can basically cure it. And let's just pause here, because if people haven't heard of a fecal transfer, what is it? Uh, it's gross. It's just like it sounds. You take feces from a normal person, and either you give an enema or you do a tube down the, that, and you basically put normal feces from one person into another person. Yeah. And you basically transfer all the microbes from one gut into another, and that cures the disease. And that was a turning moment in the field when we realized that we could actually change microbes to basically cure a life-threatening disease. And that's when lights went on, that we, if we could put the right microbes in, in the right context, we could actually start to think about many of these diseases, because you can change the microbes. You can't change your genes, but you can change your microbes. So but how I, common is that? Because I mean, I've heard yeah. of it, but I mean, it's something, because right, right. I, I think the danger, not the danger, that's the wrong word, but the, the, the frustration is, I think, is a lot of people hear these conversations and go, oh, right. that's really, why can't I do why that? Can, why, yeah. why can't I walk into my and office and say... And that's where we hit the, the wall of still waiting for the clinical trials. I mean, there's many fecal transfer trials underway for inflammatory bowel disease, for autism, for obesity, but the data is still coming in. Mm -hmm. So you hear these spectacular things like you can take feces from a fat mouse, put it in a thin mouse, it'll get fat. You can do it the other way around. You can take fat people feces, put it in the thin mice, they get fat, and yeah. vice versa. So when you hear that, say, well, I'll just go get a fecal transfer from a thin person to lose weight, yeah. right? How hard can it be? Yeah. And, but then they actually put, had to put the brakes on that because um, you don't know what else you're transferring. You're worried that this is, a, this is basically a body fluid transfer. So what are the things we can do? Because I, you know, I think about when you walk in a room, I'm assuming you don't use hand sanitizer. That's probably not something not you need for. Not unless it's a, you know, a cancer ward yeah. or an old folks home kind of thing. There but are places we, for hygiene. Yeah. Right, but what do we do day to day? I mean, what are some things that you know, either we can be aware of or our children, if, or if we're thinking of having kids, what do we right, need to do? Right, right. Well, I mean, I wrote this book called Let Them Eat Dirt, and it was really designed for the average parent that's asking, what what can I do that's good for my kid? Yeah. And there's actually the books oh, full of a whole bunch of, you know, try this, you can do these types of things based on the science, the science is there. And there's many common things you could do, and really it's common sense. You need to balance the hygiene versus the microbial exposure. So if you walk into a room and everyone's coughing and hacking, it's flu season, wash your hands, of course, that, that's hygiene, right? 
But, you know, if you, your kid's at home playing on the floor and they're licking the floor, fine, you know? <laughs> if it's the floor of the subway, think twice about it, right? So you gotta be logical here. So I think we, we, we're, we're, we're paranoid about exposing our kids to microbes because of this hygiene worry. And we have to get over that. And so we gotta ease up a bit. I mean, I see people in playgrounds all the time. The kid goes, you know, down the slide, comes over, gets their hands washed, and they go on the swing, gets their hands sanitized again. You don't need that. The kids need this, this exposure to these microbes. So a lot of it's common sense, a lot of it's foods. You can change your microbes really quickly with diet. So, you know, your mother always said, eat your vegetables, they're good for you. Wrong, eat your vegetables because they're good for the microbes that are good for you. So fruits, nuts, legumes, those kind of things, those all encourage microbial growth. If you eat white sugar, white, white flour type things, that's already broken down. That doesn't even reach the microbes deep down in your gut, you absorb it before. So ironically, you're starving your microbes even though you're eating this food. So you wanna eat the stuff that's harder to digest because that's then feeding the microbes deeper down. What is, uh, um, you're speaking to a group of people today about you know, personal performance. What is, what is the one or two things you want them to really get from this conversation? Well, I want them to get the concept that all, all microbes are bad. I mean, people only hear about these bad infectious agents and the realization that we have 100 trillion microbes living in and on us. Like, there's more microbes in and on you than there are human cells. You're no, more microbial than human in a sense. There's 15 times more microbial DNA on you than Homo sapiens DNA, right? And, and most people think, whoa, that's weird, I'm a human, right? Well, no, you're not. You're what we call a holobiont. You're you and you're all a carrier. your microbes. You're a carrier, you carry things. Well, you're, you're, you're um, yeah, this multi-organism, really. Yeah. So that's the other thing and the other thing I'm, I'm getting across is how this is a, an area that's coming fast how fast is it going to affect medicine um, cancer chemotherapies for example that was just in a meeting yesterday that showed spectacular results in immune checkpoint inhibitors they work or not depending on what microbes you have you don't have these microbes they're not going to work so you know realizing these things play a role in us and just being aware of it and addressing it and thinking about it in your day-to-day -day actions so that's the kind of messages I'm trying to get across thank you my pleasure more microbial than humans, something to think about next time uh, you look in the mirror. If you want to watch this video again uh, or see anything else that uh, we talk about on Money Talk Life, here's how you do it, moneytalkgo.com forward slash life. And that will take you to the website. I've got some fantastic articles, including uh, the uh, interview you just watched. All sorts of good stuff there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you have any comments and questions on anything you have seen, or if you'd like someone to take a look at your portfolio, if you have some planning questions, email me at moneytalk at td.com. I will get you in touch with someone who can answer those questions for you.